collapse. Now we see rates of dementias and Alzheimer's climbing to, to record levels and going to be continually climbing well into the 2050s and beyond. You know, where's, oh, no, where's the connection there between insulin resistance and, and how the brain functions? Yeah, it's, it's quite a fascinating connection, frankly. So typically when we look at what insulin does, uh, it's, it's very common that we, we really describe insulin through, uh, through its effects on glucose. And that's okay. That is certainly much of uh, an important feature of insulin, but it's also a little unfair because insulin does so many other things too. But let's just go with that one. One of insulin's main effects is to lower glucose. And it does that by pushing the glucose or helping the glucose move from the blood into specific tissues, most especially the muscle. Insulin helps the muscle take in glucose, as well as fat cells. Insulin helps fat cells take in glucose. But the brain also has some of these same insulin-dependent glucose transporters, and thus insulin is at least partly responsible for some of the glucose that the brain is taking in. And the brain uses glucose very well, of course, but as the brain becomes insulin resistant, you now have lost some of that glucose uptake into the brain. But the brain still has its same high metabolic demand. Indeed, the brain is a high metabolic rate organ. It is a very active organ and glucose provides much of that fuel. And most people, it's the only available fuel. And we can elaborate on that more in a moment. But in the case of insulin resistance, the brain now can't get enough glucose to meet its energetic demands. There is this energetic gap, you know, where uh, where there's this this space um, between, you know, this differential where where the glucose uptake ought to be versus where it is, and that little energetic gap is something we can detect in Alzheimer's disease. Also, we detect it in depression. We detect it in migraine disorders. We detect it in epilepsy with seizures. These, a lot of these neurological disorders, what they have in common is that there is this phenomenon referred to as brain glucose hypometabolism. So the brain isn't metabolizing glucose at the same rate that it was before. And it's likely because, certainly in the case of dementia, there's a degree of insulin resistance in the brain. And that is why it is so commonly seen together, disease, like uh, uh, insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease, to the point that many refer to Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes, mm. or they, which is, I don't love that term because it makes you think that there's some totally new form of diabetes, when the reality yeah. is it's just insulin resistance of the brain. That's what we're seeing in, in, in Alzheimer's disease. And those and, and the data really bear out. In fact, we have under review right now a manuscript where we studied human brains, so of course post-mortem, from normal, non-demented individuals and people who had Alzheimer's disease. And we detected broad reductions in the demented brains with regards to genes that were involved in, in glucose uptake and glucose use. So there was a clear reduction in these genes and their protein products involved in glucose use in those brains. However, there was no reduction in ketone use and ketone uptake. And that becomes important because that energetic gap that I mentioned earlier, it can be filled by the other primary fuel for the brain, and that is ketones. And so if someone who has Alzheimer's disease bumps up their ketones, you can improve brain function. You can detect this in real time. You can have them do some tests to determine the, their mental fitness and detect that it's very poor, unfortunately. Put them into ketosis, increase their ketones, have them do these tests again, and now all of a sudden their mental fitness has improved. They, they, they perform better. They're able to communicate better. They're able to perform tasks like getting dressed better. And all of this is published case studies in the, in the biomedical literature. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and unfortunately, most people um, are eating so much um, starchy, sugary foods so often that their insulin is chronically elevated. And that means the brain has no choice. It's basically like we're telling the brain, you can only use glucose because insulin is elevated. And so insulin is demanding that, that glucose be the only available fuel because if insulin is elevated, we cannot make ketones. We can only make ketones when insulin is low. Most people 
never really give the brain a break. They're never in ketosis because they eat so much of the wrong things so often that the chronically elevated insulin is ensuring there's never sufficient ketones to feed the brain. Yeah, it's it's a it's amazing, isn't it? The prevalence of obviously processed food and snack food, and of course everyone's staying up later and watching yep. Netflix until midnight or two a.m. And as you mentioned, we're snacking throughout the day, throughout the night. We're getting up in the morning. First thing that goes in. Unfortunately, yep. for a lot of people, it's quite a high energy, high carbohydrate meal. And if you're struggling with glucose control or metabolic health, and that's unfortunately not the best approach. And just as you mentioned, it's almost like the party never stops. The the music doesn't ever stop. The lights don't go off. And so this constant you know fuel coming in and, and, and this resistance taking root and it was seemingly paradoxical to have this sort of excess of energy yet the the tissues not being able to take it up um, yeah well said well said i agree with that sentiment completely and to your point around the ketones i mean obviously using a dietary approach to get a client a patient into this state is is ideal but you know as a stopgap using a, a supplement supplemental ketones would we see similar effects to you know, for that Alzheimer's, that dementia brain that you talked about previously? Yes. yes, yes, you do. In fact, some of the case studies I just mentioned actually relied on exogenous ketones to just push the person into a deeper state of ketosis very rapidly. And in the case of dementia, there might be some true utility there because it might be very difficult to get an Alzheimer's patient to cooperate. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the pathology is that they be, they may become a little combative and, and you know, they, they aren't going to you know, necessarily be happy about a dietary change if, if you know, anyone ever is. Um, and, and so, yeah, the use of exogenous ketones in, in those cases could be uh, very warranted and very effective. Yeah, it is it's always nice to be able to use something as a, you know, to, to achieve the outcome in, in a short manner whilst you're working on, as you mentioned, the more tricky adherence and compliance things like diet, exercise, lifestyle. It's great to have something in there that we can be applied right away. And you know, if we zoom back out to 30,000 feet here, Ben, and look at, you know, weight gain, meta poor metabolic health being at the root of all this. And, you know, a few years back, I had Dr. Nicola Guest on the podcast and talking about how, you know, for type 2 diabetes reversal, weight loss was about 90% of the whole story. And so when we look at strategies to help to offset this, you know, obviously weight loss has got to be front and center, but we also see in terms of type 2 diabetes, low-carb diets, potentially offering more benefits than some other types of nutrition strategies. You know, can you enlighten us with, with some of the, the methods that we could employ to, to better support metabolic health? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, in fact, this is at the heart of my entire conversion that I underwent over the last 10 years. Um, I was, uh, in fact, just to put some background here, 10 years ago, I was as much opposed to a low-carb diet as anyone. I was very dogmatic in my approach, and I... I had not seen any data to suggest it was helpful whatsoever. And then it was as I started really diving into insulin resistance and wanting to understand the causes more, I increasingly appreciated the role of chronically elevated insulin in insulin resistance. And even confirmed studies in my own lab um, highlighting that, that role. And, uh, and so acknowledging the role of elevated insulin as a driver of insulin resistance, I then acknowledged the, the, I guess, logical consequence of that, which would be that then reducing insulin will be part of the therapy, um, the therapeutic for that. And, and that is what first led me to wanting to start searching the, the literature for the efficacy of low-carbohydrate diets and even ketogenic I couldn't believe it when I started looking at ketogenic. I thought ketogenic diets were, you know, like four-letter curse words. I, uh, but I, I thought I am a scientist. I need to be academically honest and open to exploring this. But I would want anyone to know that I, I, I did not. I don't have any skin in the game here. I truly came to the conclusion that low-carbohydrate diets were superior, based exclusively on the available data. And the absolute reality is low-carbohydrate diets lower insulin more effectively than low-fat diets. Even if it's low-fat, low-calorie, the low-carbohydrate diet, even if it's calorie unrestricted, will lower insulin more and lower fat mass more. In fact, often significantly more. In this, now, I will, having said all that, and I, I want to state that with an exclamation mark, um, mm -hmm, nice. that is the reality of the situation. Uh, when, however, there is some nuance, there is one study 
that actually took this a, a step further and looked at the effects of low-fat and low-carb diets in people that were separated based on their insulin sensitivity. The insulin-sensitive people responded marginally to both and equally to both. Modest changes in low-carb, modest changes on low-fat. However, the insulin-resistant people had no response to the low-fat diet, and nothing changed, but they had powerful, substantial responses to the low-carb diet. And so if we look at someone who's worried about insulin resistance or has it or has full-blown type 2 diabetes, without a doubt, the low-carb diet is going to be the single most relevant approach. This is even increasingly acknowledged by the American Diabetes Association. And that is a big step because these governing bodies don't make changes very easily. And the fact that the American Diabetes Association has now explicitly stated that low-carbohydrate diets are effective dietary interventions. That's a big win for those of us that have been beating that drum for years. And th indeed, there have been people beating the drum far longer than I have been. But my, my evolution in appreciating the role of low-carb diets came explicitly because of the data being so overwhelmingly in favor of th this, this idea that controlling carbs is the key to controlling insulin. And that, in turn, is the key to controlling insulin resistance.